Marty, thank you. Principals, partners, staffers, thank you for this opportunity for us to share our mission and vision. If you think about it, over the course of the last 20 years, the size, scope, and power of government at all levels has grown substantially. And I know of no better example of this than in Los Angeles, California. Who knew, who knew that you can be an LA County lifeguard and make up to $510,000 a year? I guess life's a beach if you're an LA County lifeguard. In my then column at Forbes and on the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal, we put Baywatch on Paywatch. We actually found 98 LA County lifeguards made more than $200,000 last year. 20 of them made more than $300,000 and the top paid LA County lifeguard made up to 510,000. We actually found one of those lifeguards made nearly $1 million over the previous six year period in overtime alone. Now, as many of you know, I'm from Illinois. It is the Super Bowl of corruption. In one uh, period, recent period, four out of our last nine governors served time in the federal penitentiary, and 2013 was a particularly bad year. We had two Illinois governors, one from each party, in the federal penitentiary at the same time. It was Rod Blagojevich, the Democrat, and George Ryan, the Republican. And I remember in 2011 when one of our most famous citizens, Rahm Emanuel, ran for mayor of Chicago on a good government platform. Rahm promised to end pay to play in City Hall. He promised to end the historic culture of corruption in City Hall. And you know what pay to play is. You give campaign donation, you expect the city contract. And so sure enough, he won. He issued an executive order. You couldn't give him a donation if you were a city contractor. So I got a call from Fox News headquarters, the Emmy award-winning journalist at the time, John Stossel, in 2015 when Ron was running for re-election, and he said, can you fact check Rahm Emanuel's campaign promise? And I said, yes, we can. We took the city of Chicago checkbook, we matched it up with Rahm's campaign donor disclosures, and here's what we found. 600 city vendors gave Rahm Emanuel $7 million in campaign donations, and those vendors received $2 billion in city payments. And God, we trust Illinois politicians, we must audit. And that's a better return on investment than many of you can provide your clients, right? Now, despite the corruptions in Illinois and across the country, I'm hopeful and optimistic about our future. Because in the last 5,000 years of human history, you and I have been given the greatest gift. It's a recognition in our founding documents that our rights, they don't come from government, they come from God. And our, our founders knew uh, that we needed the tools to be able to hold the government accountable. The government was instituted to secure our rights. Our founders knew that knowledge was power and they actually recognized the power of transparency and they wrote it in to the United States Constitution. So it's Article 1, Section 9, Clause 7, the Powerful Appropriations Clause. And the second half is all about transparency. A regular statement and account of the receipts and expenditures of all public money shall be published from time to time. So today, in the Internet age, there's a clear interpretation. Post every dime online in real time. Open the books. And that's our mission at OpenTheBooks.com. It can be summarized very easily into every dime online in real time. It's not radical. Think about it. You've had online checking in your personal checking account for the last 20 years. It's about time that we get that for government. Here's how we've executed on our promise. I'm introducing today the $7 million investment that we've made into Benjamin the chatbot. Go back to 1789 when Be Benjamin, Dr. Benjamin Franklin leaves the Constitutional Convention and he's asked by a constituent, Dr. Franklin, what do we have here? And he says, a republic if you can keep it. At Benjamin the chatbot, we filed the data backing it up. We've compiled it by filing 55 
5,000 Freedom of Information Act requests last year. Over the course of the past five years, we've successfully prosecuted 250 thousand Freedom of Information Act requests to capture basically every dime taxed and spent at every level of government across the entire country. I'm talking federal, state, and local for the first time in American history. It answers the burning question. Since 1789, what the heck is my government up to? And now, with, by answering three easy questions, you can follow the money. If you've got a fifth grader in a history class, you can look up the salary of their teacher. We've got 25 million public employee salaries, virtually everybody that works for government at the federal, state, and local level. We've got every single one of the 50 state checkbooks. We have 17,000 municipal level checkbooks, including 4,000 school districts where you can follow the vendor spending. If you want to look, if your neighbor has a farm and, and you know he does really well, and he's, you want to see if he or she is receiving a farm subsidy, you can look them up. If you want to see who works on, on the president's White House payroll, you can look them up. Three easy questions, the answers are delivered right to your inbox. It's an amazing piece of technology. As a matter of fact, I'll make the aggressive statement. This Benjamin the Chatbot, with every dime online and as real time as possible, is the most significant and important public policy invention in our history. Because for the first time, we've unsiloed all government spending. No walls, no hurdles. You can look across the entire public sector complex to get answers to your questions. So you can follow the money, so you can hold the political class accountable for tax and spend decisions. And not only do we open the books at openthebooks.com, we audit them and our audits make national news. So you might have questions. What if President Joe Biden doesn't run for reelection? What if it's Gavin Newsom? You might question whether Gavin Newsom, when, as governor of California, has solicited state vendors for campaign donations. Now it's legal. Pay to play in California is legal for the governor but many people might think it's highly unethical. When you take the California state checkbook and you match it up with Governor Gavin Newsom's campaign donor disclosures, here's what you find. Newsom solicited a thousand state vendors for $10.6 million in campaign cash that in August of 2022, that was 40% of his cash on hand. Those thousand vendors in one year out of the California state checkbook received 6.2 billion dollars. You may want to fact check the mayor of San Francisco, London Bridge. He became mayor on a promise to clean up the streets of San Francisco. Obviously, San Francisco has a homeless problem, and many of the homeless are defecating on city streets. So we, we uh, actually fact checked her uh, campaign promise. In 2011, there was 5,500 instances called to the city's 411 line of human waste in the public way. By 2017, that number had increased to 21,000 uh, cases. By 2019, that number had increased to 28,000 cases. So from 2011 through 2019, on an interactive mapping platform at openthebooks.com, and you may have seen this trend on national Twitter, uh, we mapped 120,000 cases of human waste in the public way. And yes, we did use brown pins. And let me tell you, there was a brownout in the Bay Area. Now, in the red state versus blue state debate last fall, you probably saw it was uh, the governor from Florida, Ron DeSantis, and it was, it was actually the pinnacle moment of the Ron DeSantis presidential campaign. And he was debating Governor Gavin Newsom, and he held up our map of San Francisco. We immediately updated the map, and here's, here's the update through, uh, through the end of 2023. There's 35,000 cases in 2023. It's not getting better in San Francisco. It's getting worse. Since 2011, there was 270,000 cases of human poop on city streets. All right, so we uh, at OpenTheBooks.com, uh, not only do we open the books, we audit them. The audits make national news. And we are on some of the biggest fights in the country. 
So as Marty said, you may not know of us, but certainly you'll know some of our stories. So let me I'll just put this out of the room, a little poll. Uh, during the pandemic, who was the most highly compensated federal employee? Fauci. We broke that story. My then column at Forbes. Uh, Fauci out earned everybody, every bureaucrat, president of the United States. It was national news. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, the staggering cost of U.S. military gear left behind in Afghanistan. During a 20-year period on, on uh, gear and training, we put in $82.9 billion into Afghanistan. And so in the summer of 2022, as the Taliban was advancing on Afghanistan, that was, the, that was the question that everybody wanted to know. And we were able to nail that number from State Department audit reports. When I published this in my then column at Forbes, those audit reports were actually ripped down. Here's what they said. We put in 600,000 weapons, including 350,000 M4s and M16 rifles, 65,000 machine guns, 25,000 grenade launchers, 2,500 uh, howitzers and mortars. A howitzer is a modern day cannon. It could take out a road, a bridge, or an airport runway. We put in 75,000 vehicles into Afghanistan, military vehicles, 50,000 light and medium tactical vehicles, 22,000 Humvees. Each Humvee costs the American taxpayer up to $92,000 a piece. We put in 1,000 mine resistant vehicles and those vary between 350,000 and three quarters of a million dollars. If we ever go back into Afghanistan again, we've lost the nighttime advantage. We left behind 16,000 pieces of night vision and infrared uh, equipment in Afghanistan. If we ever go back in, it will come at a cost in terms of our national treasure and our lives of military service members. Now, the Bible has a phrase that the truth will set you free. It doesn't say the narrative will set you free, but the Biden administration was running the narrative that this was the most successful extraction of a fighting force in all of human history. And it wasn't true. We use State Department audit reports, our own information from the US checkbook at openthebooks.com to hold the Biden administration accountable. And our findings debuted on the BBC, uh, the Washington Post, when the State Department ripped down those audit reports, the that we had reposted them on our website, the Washington Post was linking to our website to hold everybody accountable to the facts. Um, just recently during the fall, we did it again. So uh, during the Trump years, there was a first ever freeze on Palestinian aid that flowed through the United Nations UNRWA uh, agency. And Trump froze that. Uh, aid in 2018, and Biden restarted it in April of 2021. Uh, after the uh, 10 7 attacks on Israel with Hamas, we wanted to know how much the restart of that aid had cost the American taxpayer. It was a billion dollars. And so we got this right to Fox News and right on the lawn of the White House. Ed Lawrence broke that story. The White House immediately pushed back. They said, We're not familiar with that number. You need to pull the report. Fox didn't. We had it, we had it cold, we were able to demonstrate that. And this is how important that is. Because now the Israeli intelligence dossier tells us that that UNRWA United Nations agency was overrun by militant Islamic terrorist members in their group. And we were funding that to the tune of $1.2 billion. And even the Biden administration now has frozen aid to that account. One of the biggest conversations in the country is on di uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And last week we popped a really big story. So we noticed on Friday last week at the University of Florida, uh, Florida uh, terminated 28 staffers, $5 million uh, dedicated to their DEI efforts. And so we took a look at the University of Virginia. Immediately, we had pre-captured the payroll at the University of Virginia. So we wanted to see how they compared to Florida. It's an interesting comparison because UVA is actually uh, in some part founded by Thomas Jefferson, the author of the Declaration of Independence, 
all men are created equal. And DEI actually goes in a different direction. Rather than having equal opportunity, there's equal outcomes. So we wanted to see how many staffers at the flagship university in Virginia were responsible for the effort. The number was 235 for $20 million. And even Elon Musk tweeted out our findings. We had a lot of success at the Department of Defense. They run K through 12 public schools about a year ago. So we had investigated We'd worked with whistleblowers, members of Congress. They wrote oversight letters to Lloyd Austin at the Department of Defense on the DEI, first ever DEI office at the Pentagon. And uh, in, with much fanfare, Gil Cisneros, the acting uh, director of readiness and personnel at the Pentagon, announced that they were terminating the first ever office of DEI at, at the Department of Defense K-12 public schools. So that was a big that was a big win for OpenTheBooks.com. We were tip of the spear on all that oversight, all those letters, and what was going on in terms of curriculum. It was used to pass the Parents' Bill of, Bill of Rights in Congress that military families now will be able to see the curriculums for their students in the classroom. But we didn't stop. What we've now learned is that the entire initiative was just buried underground and embedded in everything they do, and so that has also led to more congressional oversight, more letters, and that story continues. At OpenTheBooks.com, we punch above our weight. Last year, we published 700 investigations. I personally did 600 TV and radio interviews. Our organization received 14,000 media citations last year. And we filed 55,000 Freedom of Information Act requests and captured nearly the entire government spend at every level. I'm very proud about that. We did it all on $3.5 million, what a medium-sized state think tank would do. We are in there against Brookings, who raises $120 million a year, or Heritage on the right that raises $100 million a year, or ProPublica that raises $50 million a year. ProPublica has 100 journalists. Outside of myself, we have three. And we did one out of every three media mentions that they did with 3% of the journalists on staff. So we worked very hard. Here's our congressional impact last year. 27 times our findings came in front of Congress last year. Here's how that breaks down. 10 congressional floor speeches that cited openthebooks.com and were on our topic of, of our findings. 10 congressional oversight letters from members of Congress to the federal agencies. Seven times, on a, seven times amendments built on our oversight came before Congress and we went five and two last year. And that's impact. Just last week, we had another, just last week, we had another uh, of our investigations come before Congress. So not last summer, but two summers ago, you remember Dr. Anthony Fauci in the well of Congress being quizzed by U.S. Senator Rand Paul on third party paid royalties. During the pandemic, many people felt or started to feel that Big government was very close to big pharma. And we identified this database of third party paid royalties. We knew that NIH, the agency every year, they doled out 56,000 grants for about $32 billion worth of funding, basically buying new friends across the entire healthcare complex in the country, right? So we wanted to know what was flowing back it through the other door because every single one of those payments had the potential or the appearance to being a conflict of interest. So we filed a Freedom of Information Act request for that database and it was ignored. We sued in federal court. We've had a couple of lawsuits on it. We've moved the ball on it. Um, how, however, uh, when Fauci was in the hot seat with US Senator Rand Paul questioning him, he wouldn't answer any questions on it. Well, just, just last week, uh, Paul uh, submitted legislation to bring transparency to that database, and it passed out of committee on a bipartisan basis, 12 to zero. 
All right, I want to wrap up with the following story. The legendary U.S. Senator, Dr. Tom Coburn, a small state U.S. Senator from Oklahoma, he ran transparency and accountability hard in the U.S. Senate. They called him Dr. No, because a thousand times he used the Senate rules to stop pork barrel spending. What he couldn't stop, he embarrassed his colleagues. He published an annual waste book report. And when Coburn was getting ready to leave the Senate, he was listed on the Time 100, the 100 most influential persons in the world list. Because of these concepts of transparency and holding people, including his colleagues, accountable for spending taxpayer money. When he was leaving the Senate, he told the following story. Now, he, he, when he left the Senate, he came aboard OpenTheBooks.com. I fought in the same trench, arm in arm with Dr. Coburn for about five years before he passed away, now about four years ago. Uh, when he was leaving the Senate, he, he told the story. He said, he gave a warning to all of us. I mean, Coburn was a, he, was, he delivered babies back in a small town in Oklahoma. He loved being a doctor. He delivered about 4,000 babies during his medical career. And he said that on the law, large numbers, sometimes there would be a delivery that would get in trouble. And you knew there was a problem when the baby's heartbeat, which is normally 130 to 140 beats a minute, would drop to 50 or 60 beats a minute. Coburn said, when you notice that, you had three minutes. You had three minutes to save the life of the mother, to save the life of the baby. And he said you had options. You could go for the forceps and pull the baby out. You could go for the vacuum extractor. You could make the decision to take the mother, put her up on the table, cut a hole in her belly, and take the baby by C-section. But Coburn said you had, you had to make a decision. You had three minutes to take action. Coburn said here in America, on our exploding national debt and our wasteful spending, this is our three-minute moment. We have to take action. At OpenTheBooks.com, we give you all the data so we, you and I, can keep the republic. Let's take action. Let's save the baby. Thank you. Yeah, so um, you, know, you have a three and a half million dollar budget. Uh, most of your funding comes from retail, or does it come? Do you have a couple of grant tours, large grant tours, or how does that work? Yeah, we uh, we're in, we don't take any government money. So on the pandemic, we could have qualified for seven hundred thousand dollars with the pandemic aid. We didn't take any of the money. I know that number because I had my CPA crunch it for us, so I would have the talking point. Government money would compromise our mission. We hold government accountable. And I'm very proud of that we don't take government money. Um, uh, at the height of the pandemic, my chairman and I, we had to reach in our, our pocket to meet payroll. We did that. By the end of the year, we had our best year ever. We've never looked back, but uh, we had the wherewithal to pull it out ourselves and, and we didn't take the aid. Um, so, uh, to answer your question, we're, we're funded entirely by people. We're also funded by uh, some of the top foundations in the country, uh, people that uh, want to hold both sides accountable for tax and spend decisions. So, yeah, last question. Yeah. Oh, I just say, with, with the, the Benjamin chatbot, yeah. I guess we can access that, right? or, or is that? Yes. Why not monetize that? Like, or are you monetizing that? Is there like a Description price or a pay per request or whatever to increase your funding to allow you to do your great work. Yeah, so uh, we take our charges of public charity very seriously. So, so we we release um, we release a truncated version of our data for anybody to be able to search. So, any journalist, any citizen, any think tank, any college or university can come in and get an answer to their question. Uh, you know, oftentimes when we get a Freedom of Information Act production back from government, it'll have, let's say, 26 or 28 or 30 fields. Well, we only display about six. We have to normalize our data for the website, of course. So we, we hold a lot of richer data offline, um, but publicly we disclose a truncated version of all of it, which is very valuable.
Last, last question. <laughs> uh, it's not a question that we should probably follow up. Uh, we have a platform to build called munirisk.com. Munirisk.com. It is the only transparency tool to show the finances of over 100,000 legal entities in the US that are public. And we have to pick it off, frankly, because of uh, Bloomberg's pricing was not matching the investor's ability to do that. I, I look forward to catching up with you guys because the impediment is data. Yep. So we've thought for years, and you know, we're not smart enough to figure it out, but somebody out there is definitely smart enough to figure it out that um, with, with all of this spending data, uh, somebody would be able to figure out, use that data to figure out pricing spreads on bonds, for instance. Right. Anyway, we'll chat later. Right. Uh, we spent it with eight million of our own bond, bottom line, and we have to pull it off because uh, there was a lot of street. Uh, frankly, they didn't want all that information to get in the hands of the bondholders. Yeah, and just real quick, I, I uh, um, you know, we're very hard on Republicans, for instance, on earmarks. So I want to cover that just briefly. Um, so Republicans, oftentimes, they are cross-dressers as fiscal conservatives. <laughs> <laughs> so they talk a good game back home, and they go to Washington, D.C., and they bring home the pork. Just in this latest bill, the uh, the number one Earmarker is Lisa Murkowski out of Alaska. It's $377 million she brought home to Alaska. Here's just one of the earmarks. It's $4 million for a new sewer project in a community that has less than 100 residents. So you and I are paying $40,000 per person in Pelican, Alaska for their new sewer system, thanks to Republican Lisa Murkowski. Maine, 42nd on population, fifth in this bill on earmarks because of Republican earmarker Susan Collins partnering with her Democratic colleague, functions as an independent uh, caucuses with the Democrats, uh, Angus King. They, uh, they're bringing home nearly $500 million to Maine. Uh, you know, some of Collins's earmarks just in the past year were $4 million for a new library in a town that shuttered their library just a couple of years earlier, less than 1,000 people. Uh, 2.5 million for a new police station in Caribou, Maine. That's her where she grew up. They have less than 15 sworn officers and $3 million for the Irish Heritage Museum. And look, nothing against the I'm a 16th Irish, but uh, I don't want to pay for the museum. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.